The Lord be with you. I trust this morning, if you have heard the news uh, of this weekend uh, from the Tree of Life Synagogue there in Pennsylvania, your heart is grieved as well as mine, not only at the just all too often news of another person with another gun shooting people, but coming into a house of worship, into a house of faith and doing that. And so I trust this morning as we are here together, we are mindful of those who are there, that your hearts are, are lifted up for them as we are here worshiping and thankful to God that we are in a place uh, that, that God has, has blessed as well as all other places, but that our hearts are united with brothers and sisters of all faiths, particularly those who in this climate in which we live are seemingly always under some, some need for defense. So I, I trust that you are praying with me for, for those affected and for those who cannot help but feel the ripples of, of news as this as we face, again, too, too often. So as we've come this morning to worship, I invite you to listen in to Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 46 and reading through verse 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, as we come now to hear from Holy Scripture, help us to hear your words, words that call us along the way, words that shape us, words that show us what it is you'd have us to do who it is you would have us to be. God, help us to call out to Christ and to seek to follow Him. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, I don't know about your Bible, but my NRSV has a heading to this section. It says, The Healing of Blind Bartimaeus. Now, of course, those headings aren't part of the actual text. Those aren't actually in the, uh, the text we have of Mark. They're part of what the translators, editors, the committees that put these things together, put them there in order to sort of help us figure out real quickly what this passage is about, what are the primary narratives of a particular text. Therefore, the heading helps us to know, even before we've read these verses, that the passage before us this morning is about the healing of a blind man named Bartimaeus. But this story doesn't just fall out of the sky and onto the pages of our Bibles. It isn't like the story a father makes up for his four-year-old before he goes to bed to get him to roll over so that he'll sleep the rest of the night. No, the story takes place uh, in the wider narrative of Mark's Gospel. And, and to me, it seems to play a specific role in a sections of stories that make up chapter 10. Now here again, chapters and verses are things we put in there sometime later, but they're helpful if you want to 
be able to chew the Bible in small, easy-to-swallow passages. If we take this story, this healing of blind Bartimaeus, just as it is, there's a power enough to go around. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus hears that Jesus is coming through his town, calls out his name, Jesus stops in his tracks, calls the man over, heals him, and says, your faith has made you well. You can get a lot of miles out of that story, and rightly so. In fact, it's one of my favorite stories in Mark. It's always been, if for no other reason, that it disrupts the smooth reading of Mark's gospel story. Because Jesus is a healer in Mark, and up to this point, he always sort of almost gets it right the first time, sometimes does it a second time, sometimes the people don't listen. But by the time we get to Bartimaeus... This is how it's supposed to be. And Jesus stops mid-sprint on his way to Jerusalem in order to listen to the prayer of a blind beggar. But can I tell you something? When I reread this story recently, it upset me. It made me squirm just a little bit. Not because I have a 21st century mind and can't wrap my head around this idea that a man can just say something and heal a man's blindness. No, it upset me because I found when I read the text that I didn't identify with Bartimaeus. No, I, I, I found myself identifying with the last people in this text anyone would want to identify himself with. The disciples. You see, the disciples throughout the Gospels aren't exactly the exemplary followers of Jesus, and particularly not in Mark's Gospel. And in this set of stories in chapter 10, they seem to just be tripping over their own feet to get in Jesus' way. Just look a few verses up in the chapter, maybe a page back, around verse 13. Parents are bringing their babies to Jesus to have Jesus lay his hands on them, to touch them, to bless them. Now, we were bringing our babies just a few weeks ago, weren't we? I mean, Sally and I literally were. We stood up here with Carter and Cole, who just couldn't stand to sit on the sidelines, and four other families with their babies in arms. Now you can, can you imagine, can you imagine for a moment, if in that service, one of your fellow worshipers, maybe somebody sitting on the pew with you, had stood up in the midst of that and said, now look, we got church to get to, get this baby business out of the way, come on, come on, wrap it up, wrap up this nonsense, we got to sing the doxology, we got to nod along with the choir, we got to get through the sermon, we got to get to lunch, get this baby business wrapped up. Can you imagine? Somebody might have thrown a hymnal. But that's what happens. That's what happens in verse 13. People are bringing their little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And then John, uh, Mark says, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. That's church talk for you know what they really did. These disciples were telling these mamas and daddies with their babies, hit the bricks. Jesus ain't got time for this. Jesus got places to go, empires to topple, rules to lay down, lines to draw. He's not a typical politician. He doesn't have time to kiss babies and eat corn dogs at the state fair. He's got stuff to do. Hush them babies up and get them out of the way. But you know what happens in the story next, right? Jesus saw this. He's indignant to his disciples, says to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. And if you don't receive one of these little children, like the, if you don't receive the kingdom of God, like one of these little children, you'll never, you'll never enter it. I can imagine. The disciples thought they were doing Jesus a solid, keeping the riffraff from bothering him on this all-important kingdom of God tour on the way to Jerusalem. But Jesus scolds them, points out that these children and their blessing-seeking mamas and daddies are free to come to him. And if you read on, it seems they got the message about letting folks who want to come to Jesus, let them come. Because the very next thing you know, here comes a rich man 
with a question. Now, we heard this guy's story a couple of weeks ago. Maybe you remember it. Rich man comes to Jesus, asks, what's it going to take, good teacher, to get eternal life? What do I have to do to have heaven and salvation and my mansion over the hilltop and all that jazz? And Jesus tells him, keep the commandments. The man says he has. Jesus doesn't laugh in his face. And then he tells him, well, you only lack one thing. Sell all you got, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. And then Mark says, he goes away grieving because he had a bunch of stuff. Did you notice? Maybe, maybe you weren't looking for it, but did you notice where the disciples were in that story? Nowhere. Standing on the sidelines. They don't ask to see the guy's papers his credentials. They don't want to vet his questions before he comes to Jesus. Well, I can almost see them. After Jesus has scolded the disciples about keeping those mamas and daddies away, here comes a rich man, and they physically step out of the way. After you, sir. They get out of his way. But still, I wonder if they don't kick themselves a little bit when after that man goes away grieving, Jesus turns to them and says, how hard it will be For those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Mark says they're even perplexed at those words. But Jesus says again how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom. They're all astounded. And they say to one another, And who in the world? Can be saved. Peter even pipes up, does that a lot, sticks his foot right in his mouth. Look, Lord, we've given it all up to come follow you. They got out of the man's way. Maybe if they had just held him up a little bit, said, you know, Jesus, Jesus uh, the rich man, there's, there's a time and a place for these sorts of questions. Maybe you wait till a little more appropriate time. Or maybe, maybe they set him straight with their own working knowledge of what Jesus is about. Then maybe... Maybe they wouldn't have had to hear what Jesus had to say. All that unsettling stuff. We do that from time to time, don't we? Don't we? Someone has a deep, burning question for God, for Jesus. And like an office manager running interference for the CEO, we step in and say, I'm sorry he's tied up right now, but I'll offer you my opinion. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me me tell you what's really going on. Because it's much easier, isn't it, to tell people what we think than to lean in with them and honestly listen to what the Spirit of God may say or maybe worse yet, what the Spirit of God isn't saying. But the very next thing that happens may be the most infuriating thing in the whole chapter. Babies have come. A rich man came. The disciples are still trying to figure out, do we let folks come to Jesus? Do we let people talk to Jesus? And then in verse 35, James and John, two of their own, the sons of Zebedee, come forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, they learned. Jesus said to the rich man, Don't call me good. I dropped the good. Just call him teacher. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Excuse me. We want you to do for us whatever you ask. The Zebedee brothers come to Jesus and say, Jesus, do for us what we want. The guts on those two boys. Now, 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 I I like the way Matthew tells it. I think Matthew wants to give them a little dig because you know what happens in Matthew's gospel, right? It's not James and John who come to Jesus. Who is it? It's their mama. Matthew says, oh, mama comes to Jesus. Mm. That's sad when grown men's mama come asking Jesus for something. But in Mark, it's James and John. Where are the rest of them? Where are the other ten while this is going on? Still hanging back there, trying to do the calculus. Do we interrupt? Do we keep them from Jesus? What do we do? Are they waiting to see how Jesus might treat two of their own when they come asking for something? All I know is that Jesus, again, responds to these two with the grace and gentleness that only Jesus can. I'd have told him where to go and what bus to take to get there. But Jesus doesn't do it. Grace, gentleness, then harsh words. And then we're told by Mark that when the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. Can you blame them? 
They're either angry because James and John have done the very thing they know they're not supposed to do. Don't interrupt Jesus. We're on the way to Jerusalem. Stop bothering him with these silly questions. Or, and I think this is probably really the reason, they're angry because none of them had the guts to do it first. But all I know is that it seems like this little stunt from the Zebedee brothers was just enough, just enough for the disciples to click back into their Messiah's secret service mode when they come to Jericho. There had been enough lollygagging, enough distractions. It was time to get back on track with their expectations of Jesus and this kingdom. We're going to Jerusalem after all. we got to stop it with this distracting business. That's why when a blind beggar on the side of the road shouts, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, Mark says, many sternly ordered him to be quiet. They've had a belly full of this sort of stuff. You can't take two steps without somebody wanting to come ask Jesus a question, wanting something from Jesus. You can't even walk through town down the main drag without somebody hollering his name. We've had enough of this stuff. There are things to do, an agenda to stick with. We've got to keep this thing moving. Who's got time to humor some old beggar on the side of the road? You know, I saw in 2020 one time, Sometimes they may not even be blind. Oh, no, I heard about, a rich, about one of them beggars on the side of the road, got a nice big old house in a gated community, tax-free, because he sits out there two hours a day, taking up money, washing windshields, ain't worked a day in his life. Oh, he probably ain't even really blind, probably ain't even really a beggar. Don't give him any money. Don't pay him any mind. I saw it on the news or somewhere. Anyhow, just shut him up. Just keep him quiet. Somebody tell that boy to hush before Jesus hears him and we got to put the brakes on this thing again. How many people, how many people have we tried to keep from crying out to Jesus because of our own ideas about what Jesus is up to? How many people have we told to hush because we're on the way with Jesus and we ain't got time for them? How many people have we told the hush because we wanted to get in on with this whole thing all by ourselves? I get the feeling sometimes, sometimes we're like those kids who sit in the back of the class, close to the door. Prof looks at his watch. The clock on the wall goes, oh, well, what do you know? Looks like we're going to get done a few minutes early today, unless anybody has a question. The people who laugh are the ones sitting at the back of the room because you know what you're doing. If you could, you could subconsciously blow their heads off. You better not ask a question. I can get in a five-minute nap. I've got something to do. I've got my own agenda. Like we're daring them to raise their hand, subconsciously threatening anyone who might be confused because we got other things on our minds. I mean, how many folks who follow Jesus are out there trying to protect him from those who might call out his name as if Jesus needs protecting from anything? How many folks have we kept from Jesus because we decided that they weren't worthy of the time it would take to acknowledge their existence? Just keep on moving on. Just keep this whole thing going. We don't have to pretend they're even real. Just keep this whole thing going. How many people have been held back from Jesus, the Jesus they themselves are trying so desperately to know, to meet, to love, because those of us who call ourselves Christians have determined that it's our job to run interference, to treat the church like some sort of movement that can't stop for the likes of those who aren't already a part of it. How in the world can anybody think that? But I suppose... I suppose we could find some solace in the fact that the first disciples did it. I mean, Peter, James, John, all of them, they did it. And here's the thing. Jesus was right there with them. They tried to get Bartimaeus to hush. Shut him up. Keep him quiet. Stop him from distracting Jesus. But Mark says, he cried out even more loudly, Son of David! Have mercy on me. 
Because you see, try as they might, Jesus' disciples could not shut him up. Try as they might, they could not silence this one who longed to see Jesus. This, long, this one who longed for mercy from Jesus. Did you notice that? And all the other stories in chapter 10, everyone else wants something from Jesus. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, can you bless my little baby boy so he'll grow up strong and smart? Jesus, bless my little girl so she'll be pretty, land a good husband, not have to work another day in her life. Good teacher, can you tell me, can you tell me what I need to do to get in? How to inherit eternal life? How I can go to heaven when my toes go up? Teacher, give us what we want. A nice chair on your left hand side, a nice chair on your right hand side. The number two and three salaries in the kingdom of God. Jesus, teacher, can you give us, can you give us, but not Bartimaeus. What's Bart say? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They can't hush up the one who's seeking mercy. So many people looking for mercy. So many longing for a taste of grace. So many yearning for the slightest sliver of love. And I wonder, do we tell them to hush? Do we we tell them to hush when within their longing, within their hurting, within their very souls is the faith to make them whole? Do we tell them to hush? Do we jump at the chance to defend the Jesus we think we own when another cries out hoping to hear a word from God in Christ? How many times? How many times have I tried to silence the cries for mercy from those sitting on the side of of life's roads? On the margins of our clearly defined self-drawn lines for who's in and who's out. How many times has somebody been sitting on that line and I've told them to hush? And still, still they cry out, Jesus, have mercy on me. And every time I draw that line, every time I try to hush the cries of those outside of those lines I've drawn, lines I've drawn out of my proof-texted passages of Scripture, lines I've drawn out of my comfort, out of my arrogance, out of my ignorance, out of my selfishness, out of my sinfulness, every single line and every single time I've said hush to those who just want to taste a glimpse Some faint shimmer of love from God. I have somewhere down the road myself found that I cry out, Jesus, have mercy on me. Because, friends, the truth is, no matter how many times we tell those folks to hush, no matter how many times we try to keep Jesus out of the hands of those we deem unworthy, unfit sinners, no matter how many times we try to keep Jesus squeaky clean, undefiled, and unsullied by the cries of those outside, Jesus still hears them. And Jesus stops. Jesus stops. Right in the middle of whatever we think He ought to be up to, And he calls them unto himself and shows them the faith already present within them, faith enough to make them whole. In other words, friends, they're not crying out to us. They're crying out to Jesus. And Jesus is going to hear them. Jesus is going to love them. And there's not a thing we can do but either get out of the way Or join in in the wonderful work of hearing them and loving them too. And to give up thinking it's our place to tell them to hush. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, as we see ourselves and the disciples on the road to Jericho to realize, Lord, that we probably are more like Bartimaeus than we know. 
that we need your mercy. For Lord, otherwise we're just sitting blind. Help us, God, to realize that it's not our work, our place to run interference, to keep others who we deem unworthy and unfit, those who may be a distraction, those who keep us distracted from you, away from you. God, help us to hear that they're calling to you and that we are not to stop them, but to join alongside in listening and loving them just as you do as well. Jesus, give us your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, even in these moments now to hear you moving among us and to respond to your presence. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.